we talked about how the body keeps score. This is going to be a comprehensive guide to longevity. We can honestly live a much longer life if we allow ourselves to stop doing the things that slow down our progression in life and actually make our life shorter. We're going to be talking about smoking. We're going to be talking about alcohol. We're going to be talking about stresses of the body. A lot of things that you may not have thought actually affect your physical body. They do. How much you sleep at night, believe it or not, is directly tied to how long of a life you will live. All right, so moving on. So we're going to be talking about the longevity equation, how stress as a physical um, manifestation does come into your body. We're going to be talking about the body-mind connection, the toll of anxiety, the risk of smoking and alcohol, mindfulness for stress management, PT, physical exercise, physical training. It's more than just, just for your muscles. Nutrition and longevity, social connection, and conclusion and homework to tie it all down. All right, so the longevity equation. Our life expectancy is not just written in our genes. It's also a product of lifestyle choices, mental health, and social factors. Everything affects the longevity of your life. Everything. From the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep and how you sleep, all of that plays a part into the longevity of your life. If you think that having one cigarette a day or having one drink every night, if that doesn't affect you, I got news for you. It does. Your body does keep track of what you put into it because at the end of the day, your body will react to what you are allowing your body to absorb. Now, there's a lot of medical advancements in public awareness and it's increased life expectancy. However, we still have the bad habits. We don't seem to understand that these bad habits are truly destroying us. These bad habits don't come from us not wanting to care for ourselves or love ourselves. These bad habits come from mindset. This is how it's all tied together. When we have a poor mindset, when we feel sorry for ourselves, when we don't allow ourselves to truly understand that everything that we do is all-encompassing, when we don't allow ourselves to remember that we can win, that we are fighter jets, your mindset is going to promote bad habits. And poor mental health can reverse this, right? Poor And poor mental health can reverse this. I think that's, I'm not sure what that, okay, maybe I wrote that wrong. Anyway. Real world example. So a research study found that a com combination of five healthy habits can extend one's life by a decade or more. A decade. That's 10 years. Avoiding the drinking. Avoiding the cigarettes. Avoiding trans fat foods, which is all the processed foods that you eat when you go to McDonald's. Avoiding excess of sugars. A lot of these things are things that can truly give you a longer life and be here. And not only that. But those 10 years that you add onto your life will actually be that much better because you're not going to be immobile. You're not going to be stationary. You're not going to be in a, you know old folks home because you can't even get up out of bed because you're obese because you've been smoking for so many years that you've developed lung cancer. Now you have to talk through a machine. And I say all this because it's true. I say all this because I'm not going to beat around the bush and tell you that you can get away with some of it and be all right with life. No, like we are here to truly transform our lives. I'm not here to tell you like it's okay to smoke here and there. I'm not here to tell you that it's okay to have some bad habits and you'll be okay. No, I'm here to tell you that if you truly believe in yourself and you work on your mindset with me in this program, you can change the trajectory of your life, which means your life can end up in a different place than when it will end up right now. And all of this does matter. Now, stress, stress as a physical manifestation, stress is not merely an emotional disturbance. It actually does manifest physically, increasing the risk of hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. When you're stressed out, your muscles tense and stress actually does uh, inflame the fascia, which is inside of the muscles, basically. And the fascia of your muscles will become tense. When it's tense, it won't release. When it doesn't release, it won't grow. So your stress that your life has is going to prevent you from muscle growth. It's going to prevent you from being able to fully feel stretched out, be able to not have those back pains. And you might think, well, stress is, you know, life. Yeah, life happens and we have stress. But the thing that changes from stress to something that can promote growth inside of you is how you respond to it. So when something happens to you that typically you identify as stressful when you decide to respond to it differently. When you decide to slow down time and take the emotion out of it and truly think about what your options are, you can use that as an opportunity for growth. 
And now your mindset just evolved. You were able to not emotionally react to it. You were able to take that out of it and you were able to actually handle it as a situation where you didn't physically stress out your body and your body doesn't retain that. Now imagine how beautiful that is that even the things that usually stress you out in life, you can transform and turn them into things that are going to help you in life. We talked about this on Mindset Monday. Now, stress activities, the fight or flight response. It releases cortisol and adrenaline into your body. Over time, this will begin to hurt you. So if you're always in a fight or flight response, this is going to negatively... Sorry, Siri's trying to talk to me. This is going to negatively affect your body. Now can we prevent being in that fight or flight response? We can prevent that by making sure that we're reacting to things. Let me take this watch off. I don't know why it keeps trying to listen to me. By being in a, in a situation where you're not just reacting to things emotionally. When something happens, for the longest, we have been very used to just reacting to it. Something happens, a bill comes up, and we just react to it. Maybe we get into a fight with our loved ones, and we just react to it. Maybe our tire pops, and we just react to it. Things that usually cause stress in our lives, we just react to it. But that is that fight or flight response. If you can slow down and you can truly calm your emotions down and realize that it's not the end of the world. There is a solution to this. Everything will be okay. The world is not falling apart on you. You don't have to go into that fight or flight response. There are other ways to handle the situation than in methods that are going to raise and release your cortisol and your adrenaline levels. Because over time, this will begin to hurt you because your body will begin to lack it because it's unregulated. Now, there was a study that was conducted on working professionals who incorporated stress management techniques had a 23% lower risk of premature death, 23% lower risk. And what are some of these stress management techniques? We've talked about a lot of them. We apply a lot of them. Anything that you can do in your life that is going to help you manage your stress is going to help you in the long run. Now, we can think of anxiety as stressful because when we feel anxious, our body tends to tense up, right? But the thing is, We can control our anxiety by having better clarity of what our options are. When we think of like, you know what, in four months, I'm going to be running out of this and I'm going to have to move. Or maybe in two months, like I'm stressed out because college is coming up and, you know, this job is ending or I have to find another job or, you know, the promotion is coming up and you start to feel anxiety from it. You start to physically react. Your body starts to absorb that. That's because you're not looking at what your options are. Now, if you lay it out and you think about it, okay, in four months, maybe I have to look for another job because this job is ending. All right, it's four months away. It's four months away. That is over 120 days to give you time to think about what you can do. And there are many things you can do. You can start looking at other jobs. You can start looking at your options. And guess what? When you start looking at other options, when you start looking at things that Maybe you can do or maybe you can't do. You're going to come upon other roadblocks. But it's about how you respond to them. So just because problem A now presented you a problem B and problem C and problem D, you treat those the same way. You don't have to react to them. You can respond to them appropriately by using stress management tools, which we'll talk further about. The body-mind connection. Chronic stress and anxiety affects your body leading to premature aging. Stress can lead to increased inflammation in the body. Now, meditation. Meditation practitioners have been shown to have the ends of chromosomes that affect aging that are 10% longer than those of non-practitioners. Meditation is hard for me. Meditation is hard for some people. Some people can dive into it. Now, I have ADHD, and that's something that I'm not hiding because I'm, I'm very much proud of it because now I'm learning how to manage it because that's something that was something that was causing me stress before but now i'm learning how to manage it and i'm not reacting to it but meditation is hard for me because i have a very hard time focusing on nothing my mind is always racing and i'm thinking about this or that or this and that but i have been able to do meditation in different ways there are different ways to do meditation it doesn't have to be in silence in a room sitting for 10 15 20 minutes on a pillow it doesn't have to be that way you can do meditation by going on a nature walk and truly trying to let go of your mind and not think about anything and just breathing and enjoying it, that is meditative. You can do meditation by using an app like Headspace or Calm, which are actually going to be guided meditations, which they walk you through the steps of how you can meditate. You don't have to necessarily sit on the floor or cross pillow. You can lay down. You can do it in the shower when you're breathing through stuff, right? You can do breathing techniques along with meditation. 
Meditation doesn't have to be boring. Meditation can be done in any way that is going to help you lower your resting heart rate. That's the goal of it. Your meditation is to lower your resting heart rate little by little and to not allow the things that come up in life to affect you the way that they've been affecting you before. And maybe all it takes is three to five minutes of focused breathing to help your body heal. And it's something that can truly change your life because at the end of the day, if you can master meditation, and, and when I say master, I don't mean perfect it. I just mean if you can master it to the point where you can allow yourself maybe one or two or three times a week to do this, you can truly allow yourself to meditate in the moments when something comes up for you. So when you get a phone call about something that stresses you out or maybe your roof is leaking and you start panicking, like you can take a moment, you can slow down, you can do breathing, and that is meditation, believe it or not. You are slowing the world around you down because you do not have to respond or react to everything immediately. You can take a moment. You can breathe through it. You can think about what your options are. You know that you're efficient at deciding because you have been practicing this and you can respond accordingly. Now, anxiety. We've talked about this a little bit, right? The toll of anxiety. So anxiety disorders can contribute to GI issues, chronic respiratory disorders, and heart disease. Constant worry leads to physiological consequences such as being able to not sleep throughout the night. It's a higher propensity for illnesses and long-term mental health issues. People who participate in anxiety management programs had a marked improvement in their digestive and cardiovascular health. Now, let me talk a little bit more in simple terms about this. Anxiety, as I mentioned, it sometimes feels like you don't know what your options are. So therefore, you feel like fear of the future. But we don't have to fear the future if we know that we have been making good decisions. A lot of us, sometimes we fear the future because we think that we're going to make the same mistakes we've made in the past. But we forget that the past is four, five, six, seven, eight years ago. In the present tense, in the past six months, in the past year, you've likely made better decisions than you made in the past. So in the future tense, you're more likely to make better decisions than you've done in the way, way past because you are making better decisions now because of all the things you're practicing all the things you're doing. You have to learn to trust yourself. You have to learn to love yourself. And anxiety is truly something that manifests when you feel this fear of the unknown, when you feel a fear of something that may or may not happen, when you feel this fear of the way you're being treated. All of these different places will bring you anxiety. But when you remind yourself that you are in control, that there is a solution to the problem, you can remove yourself from that stressor because if something is stressing you out, you can detach. We've talked about this, detaching. And you can make the proper decision. You can respond appropriately. When you feel depressed, you have to get out into the world. Go for a walk. Go lift. Go do something with people. Get into nature. Do something. That's going to help you lift you out of that. With the opposite with anxiety, when you feel anxiety, sometimes you have to detach from the world. And that doesn't mean go and freaking bury yourself in a pillow and fall asleep all day. That means go on a nature walk. That means do something by yourself. That means do some meditation. That means do some journaling, some reflecting. You don't have to immerse yourself in the world at all times. You decide what you do with your time and you have to remember that. Now, the risk of smoking and alcohol. I was a chronic smoker. I smoked about half a pack a day from 2014 up until 2018. So, but for four years, I smoked about half a pack a day and it was necessary for me at the time. That's what I thought. I was wrong. I've been a heavy drinker since freaking the Marine Corps up until 20, around 2018, same time. I, I, I kind of stopped drinking and that stopped for a different reason than the smoking stop. And I'll talk about them in detail, but my life completely changed, not just because I was reading Jordan Peterson's book, not just because I was applying the things that I learned from Joe Rogan, from Jocko, from different people, because I was working on cleaning up my room and cleaning up my life and limiting the negative relationships I have and following a morning routine and working out and doing all these things. My life changed because I was able to quit smoking and I limited my drinking. And the reason I say that is because when you do that, it reduces, actually increases your life expectancy by 10 years on average. If you're a smoker, your life expectancy is going to be shorter. And excessive alcohol consumption, it's going to shorten your life possibly even by 30 years, some studies show. 
And I'm not saying you have to quit drinking. I'm just saying you have to quit doing it in excess. You have to do it when you want to, not when you feel like you need to. And with the smoking, and honestly, there's no argument for smoking. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going not gonna to entertain that. There's nothing positive that comes from that. There's no benefits to it. It's putting something in your body that is a carcinogen. It is something that possibly can cause cancer inside of you. It's going to give you a shorter life. And let me just point this out to you. If you have smoked in the past and you've quit, you know how much your life changed because you were able to walk up the stairs without having to feel like you had to stop halfway up. Your life is changing because now you don't smell like smoke all the time and your kids don't want to even hug you. Your life is changing because when you're older and you're in your 50s and your 60s, you're not going to be you know, falling apart because of the way that you took care of your life. And now you can still be there and not just enjoy time with your kids, but your grandkids. Your life can change by making the decision to stop doing the things that are literally killing you. Cellular damage from smoking and liver damage from alcohol are mostly irreversible, but preventable. Now, they may be mostly irreversible, but if you quit smoking, your lung actually does repair itself to a certain extent. So don't think that, oh, I've been smoking for forever. I can't stop now. No, that's not the case. Your lungs can repair themselves. The liver can repair itself as well. And it can be preventable from you making sure that it's not something you're doing in the future. Now, there are some long-term studies that show that quitting smoking at age 30 almost completely eliminates the risk of dying prematurely from smoking-related diseases. So if you're around the age of 30 and you've been smoking and you told yourself, well, I'm a smoker, this is what I've been doing my whole life, quit bullshitting yourself. Live the life that you want to live by doing the things that you want to do. Don't just half step in, half step out. Like You truly have to be all in. And if you're going to work out, And if you're going to do meal prep and you're going to be here for the coaching calls and you're trying to get your life in order, but you're still deciding to have that cigarette here and there or the fucking vape. The vape worries me because we have no idea what's in it and we don't know what it's going to do to our kids, to us in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Like that has not been studied at all. And I, I have no idea why people do it. They think that it's less dangerous than a cigarette, I argue that it's more dangerous than a cigarette. Um, Your vice is not relaxing you. It is killing you. You have to remember, a vice is a problem. And if you have a vice of glutton, if you have a vice of, you know, being too selfish with things, if you have a vice of drinking, if you have a vice of smoking, these are things that you have to get under control. They don't have to be vices. They could just be things that you do, but you don't have to do them all the time, such as the drinking if you like to drink. And at the same time, I want you to truly think about, do I have to have this drink? Do I have to have this drink or do I want to have this drink? Am I going out to the bar because I feel like I have to? Do I really want to be here? Is this where I want to spend my Saturday night? When your friend offers you a drink, you can say no. You can say no. If you say no for so many times, eventually they will stop asking. They will get the message. If I go out and my friends want to have a drink, I'll typically have a seltzer water. And I'll fucking nurse it. I'll, I'll drink it for a while. They don't know what I'm drinking. They don't have to know what I'm drinking. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to, number one, put poison in my body if I don't want to. And that doesn't mean I don't drink. I'll have a drink here and there when I feel like I want to for the memories. Marine Corps birthday, I'm going to have a few drinks, right? But if I decide not to drink, and if I decide not to put that on my body, I'm also deciding not to allow the alcohol to influence my decisions, because we all know that the moment you decide to have a drink late at night, you're going to go and you're going to come up to that drive through at McDonald's at 2 in the morning and you're going to make bad decisions that you're going to pay for the next day. And if you're older than 30, we all know that it takes us more than a day to recover at this point. When I was in my 20s, when I was 21, I was doing a freaking PFT after I spent the whole night drinking now smoking a cigarette on the way to the run. We're not there anymore. Our body changes because our body gets older. We have to remember that the more we drink when we shouldn't have to, when we don't want to, it takes us long to recover. Our body does not appreciate it. Your sleep is going to be completely destroyed. I have um, I have this whoop thing. Um, I'm not wearing it today because I had to get it replaced. But the whoop right here tells me how my sleep is. It tells me my recovery. I put data in there every day. Um, you know, what did I do last night? And it gauges how my sleep went based off my temperature of my skin, uh, based off different things that it has four sensors, right? The number one reason why my sleep typically would be under 
10% of recovery, meaning that my sleep was 10% of what it should be, meaning my sleep was that bad for the night, it's always alcohol. That's the number one reason to why I get bad sleep. You think that when you drink, you go to bed and you sleep for 10 hours, you think that you wake up rested. That's not the case. Your body had to fight the toxins that you put into your body. Your body did probably not go into REM sleep at all or deep sleep because it has to absorb all this alcohol that you put into your body. It was not good sleep. And next day you're going to suffer for that. And then you have to get back on track. So make the smart decision when you go out and truly decide, do I want to have a drink? Do I want to have one drink and that's it? Do I need to have a drink? You don't have to be what you were. You can be more than that, okay? Physical exercise, more than just for muscles. Regular exercise goes beyond weight control. It actually enhances your immune system, improves your mental health, and like we're talking about, it extends your lifespan. 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week can add 3 to 0.4 years to your life. 30 minutes a day, 5 days a week. And that's 30 minutes a day. If we end up splitting that out, and you can do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, an hour a day for those days, and they will equal very similar. It doesn't have to be every day. In fact, you should have rest days. I don't want you guys to think that you have to go hard in the paint every single day. Kobe Bryant knew how to recover properly. He took time off when he needed to, but he went hard in the paint when he had to. You have to understand that recovery is very important, and doing PT the right way does benefit you as well. Uh, in geographic areas with the longest lived people, there's a culture of incorporating regular, low intensity physical activity into daily life. Nutrition and longevity. The benefits of a balanced diet equals more energy, lower risk of chronic diseases, and a longer overall life. There's a lot of different diets out there. You can do the Mediterranean diet, you can do the paleo diet, you can do the keto diet. And I'm only talking about this just to kind of talk a little bit about it, but it's not sustainable in the long run, in my opinion. However, the Mediterranean diet is rich in vegetables, lean proteins, which is something that you should aim for, and healthy fats. And it has been linked to longevity. Okinawa, in Japan, they're known for the longevity because they have a diet that's rich in vegetables, tofu, seafood, but low in calories and meat. It just depends on how you want to eat, and there's different ways to have a long life. We've all heard of the carnivore diet, and people are praising it, saying that you live a long life that way. In my opinion... It's not about one specific diet. You're not going to find the perfect diet. It's about making smart decisions throughout your life. So if you want to eat healthy Monday through, I'm sorry, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you regulate your carbs, your fats, your proteins, your calories, you will live the long life that you're planning to live. It doesn't have to be one of these specific diets. The point of these diets is that they're following a framework. Any sort of diet that you do is following a framework. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you guys are with me. Awesome. All right, social connection, the forgotten pillar. Strong, healthy social connections can increase your life expectancy by up to 50%. One of the things that when people say when they're passing, when they're dying on their deathbed, the number one thing that they say that they regret is that they didn't spend enough time with the people that they loved. It's not that they didn't make enough money. It's not that they wish they would have worked harder. It's not that they wish they would have done this or that. It's that they wish they would have spent more time with the people that they love. Loneliness is as lethal as smoking 15, 15 cigarettes a day because loneliness creates this identity for yourself that you are a loner, that you don't need anyone, that your life is the life that you're living, and that's it. And that's just not the case. Okay, in Sardinia, an Italian island in the Mediterranean it has a tight-knit community that contributes to the high rate of centurions. They are older people because they are tight-knit, because they support each other, because they love each other, because they don't allow negative behaviors to happen because everyone is there for each other. All right, so geography does mean a lot. If your environment is not conducive to your health, it is not wrong to move if possible. And this is meaning that if you're not happy with where you're at, and I don't mean just in the cold areas or the warm areas, I mean that if you are not happy with where you're at, you can move. If you're not happy with where you are at in life, you can change it. You can decide where you lay down roots. You can decide what you do for your life. You can decide maybe where your kids end up living because you decide to make a different move in your life. Everything that you do not only affects the longevity of your life, but it affects the livelihood that your children will have in their life. So, conclusion and homework. Longevity is a complex interplay of genetic, behavioral, and environmental factors. There's a lot more to it. However, 
at the end of the day, when we manage our stress by using breathing techniques, by doing meditation, by journaling, by doing the tools that we've talked about, by making healthy choices, by having strong social connections and being plugged in with people, because if we're making strong social connections and we have good friends, those good friends are going to promote good decisions, right? You can significantly improve your life expectancy and making sure that you live a longer and healthier life. It's not about just living a long life hooked up to machines. It's about making sure that as you get older, your body is aging appropriately because you're still taking care of yourself. Now, your homework. I want you to identify one habit in your life that you'd like to change to improve your longevity. And I want you to post it in the Facebook group once you watch this. So identify one habit you'd like to change to improve your longevity and post it on the replay in the Facebook 